I think looking at the data is important and it is scary. Like when I first started logging and I, and I looked at that number and I said, heck, I, I drank 107 drinks this week. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I didn't want to see that number, but looking at that number is part of accepting where you are at that point in time. So I, I would I would highly recommend for anybody that you know might might be a little afraid of looking at the numbers, like just just write it down. Don't worry about what the number is. Don't try and change the number. Just make make the number happen, and then forget about it. And then just keep writing them down. And like you don't have to do anything with it, but you know just I, I would say that having that history, you know, will help you see smaller progress because I wouldn't I wouldn't have without the data I wouldn't have been able to say. Oh, I think I've cut my drinking down by 30%. I'd probably, because of the negative outlook that's natural, I'd probably say nothing is happening. It's not working. Welcome, everybody. It's Katie with Embody Daily. And today I have with me Eric. Um, I'm excited to interview Eric because he's not my typical TSM interview because you know, Eric, you're kind of in the middle of your TSM journey still. And so I'm excited to pick your brain about how the experience has been going for you. Um, we met through, I think the TSM online meetups, and I've just heard you articulate your experience in there and share about the ups and downs. And I just love the way that you share your story. So I'm excited. And I want to thank you for coming on to chat with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have this conversation also. I've been looking forward to it. I know one of the things that surprised me is participating in those groups and telling my story helps me organize my thoughts and understand TSM better and understand, you know, overall um, how to help myself. And so it's it's been a good opportunity there, and I'm hoping to extend that here and uh, and see how see how all of this works for people. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I just want to jump right into it. Let's start off with you telling us, first of all, just how long you've been on the Sinclair method and how it's been going so far. Yeah. So, uh, so I've been on the Sinclair method either for four months or for a year and a half, depending on how you count. And what I mean by that is for myself, and I've heard this story from other people too, is they sort of did the Sinclair method, meaning that they weren't compliant, that sometimes they would drink without taking their pill and waiting their hour. Uh, sometimes they, you know, wouldn't, you know, it, it's that whole kind of non-compliance. And so, of course, you know, we know that if you, if you do that, that it's not going to have the effect that it needs to have. So really, I would say four months. Um, the, uh, it, over those four months, I've definitely seen some, some very solid changes. And so along with the uh, being compliant with the medication. Uh, I coupled that with um, some therapy to kind of, you know, help me understand behavioral cues um, to accelerate my process more than anything and to be able to measure my progress so that I could feel, uh, so that I could get the, the positive feelings about it and seeing it work. And by that, I mean, logging every drink, you know, I've done that, I've done that uh, compliantly the entire four months there's not a day that is not accurate and so i'm able to see that my overall drinking is reduced by about 30 percent at this point um so that's a pretty that's a pretty big deal and i can see more and more alcohol free days and maybe the one that's more exciting for me is that i'm starting to be really comfortable with days that i only have two drinks or three drinks like maybe it's because i'm out to dinner maybe it's just because i'm sitting at home and i wanted to have a beer while i'm watching tv uh, but you know, it used to be for me that there was no off switch whatsoever is that once I started drinking, there was the only thing that was going to stop me drinking is being unconscious either on purpose or by accident. Right. So I'm seeing those changes in myself and I'm seeing that excitement and not feeling like I, I have to have, um, you know, another drink and that's, that's wonderful. So, you know, where I am now is continuing to stay compliant and being really cognizant of the situations in which I still binge drink because those, those episodes are happening. And you know, it's, it, it's causing harm to my life still. And yeah. when, I, when I'm not at my best at work the next day or if I'm you know, not able to follow through on plans or just not be as happy uh, as I want to be. So that, that's kind of where I am in that journey. 
Thank you so much for explaining that. And I wanted to ask you a little bit, if you don't mind, about your first try at TSM, because I mm -hmm. think that's a common experience for people, like as you said. So would you mind telling us a little bit about maybe what you have perspective on in hindsight as to why it didn't work that first time versus why it's working well for you now? Yep, yep. So I guess to start with, uh, I've spoken to my doctor about my drinking, being candid about it, and she had suggested now Trexone. And she prescribed it like I've heard other doctors do as well, but she didn't know about the Sinclair method. So it was just take this once a day and that'll be cool. That'll help you with your cravings, right? And so I wanted to read up more about the medication I was taking. And those searches led me to uh, descriptions of TSM, uh, wound up getting, uh, getting the book and listening to that and listening to the science behind it. And that got me really excited because I'm like, this makes perfect sense to me. Uh, because I because I work in engineering, my mind works based on data. I didn't want to feed all of this information in there and try and figure things out. So that was perfect for me to to read that book, and hear about why it works and how it functions as far as changing the the, the chemistry in your brain, um, so that so that you you won't have this uh, kind of ever present and ever building kind of situation. And so um, you know I was excited about it because. Uh, I, I couldn't face the concept of abstinence. I, that's still not a goal of mine, but you know, everything else that you wind up hearing is that it's a, what I wound up hearing rather is that it's a constant struggle. Like you gotta, you gotta go to meetings for the rest of your life and you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't be in this situation. And, it, and that sounded very dreary to me. It sounded like a real grind and, uh, and not something that I felt like I was going to be capable of, even though it has worked for some people. And so the Sinclair method really gave me the alternative to that process of just quitting and then staying quit forever and in a way that made sense for me. So, so I started doing the Sinclair method based on just reading. I, I was not with any support groups. I know that I know they exist now. But at the time, all I did was read the book and I said, okay, well, I can do that. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really have it ingrained in me. It wasn't reinforced that, you know, like, like that's one of the things the groups have done for me is the reinforcement, like always be compliant, you know, always wait your hour. Like you hear that in, in the, in the meetings all the time, like it's mentioned over and over again in each and every meeting. And so without that reinforcement, I was just kind of laissez-faire about it like okay well maybe i'll maybe i'll take the pill today or oh well i was out to lunch and uh with colleagues and then everybody decided they were gonna have a beer so i'll have a beer anyway even though i have not got the pill and i wasn't planning on drinking all of that sort of thing right so you know the uh the thing that changed for me i think was really the group support um that it reinforced all of the things that you know, i'd read it i mean it was there but hearing it from other people really cements it in your mind and being able to do it that way. So that first time I, I, I did see some, some benefits like, but, but I couldn't say how much because I wasn't tracking anything and I wasn't mindful of the situations in which I was drinking more or drinking less. I just wasn't thinking about it. I was just taking the pill sporadically and then expecting something to happen. Um, and so that, that was really the thing, but I, I still believed in the science. And then, you know, when I, when I decided, uh, because of a health issue to get even more serious about, you know, cutting down drinking, that's when I sought, oh, I sought out the counseling and it was my therapist who suggested that I go find some groups, find some group support. And so that's how my, my process led from my, my poor compliance and attempts to what I feel is, is a discipline now that is paying off and I can see all of those good things happening to me. So, um, you know, I know I've heard stories from people who have tried to do TSM for years and have had difficulties. And I've heard stories of people who, who turns them around in two months. So, you know, I've, I'm just going to be patient and see how it works for me and continue to try and uh, be mindful and observe my drinking habits and what are the scenarios in which I'm drinking a lot because I, I know that physically it's not a physical craving because, you know, I can, I can go out and have four or five beers and then come home 
and I have absolutely no desire to have another beer. Like that is unheard of for me. And so I know it's associations, like I'm drinking out of habits and I'm drinking out of associations and that that's the part that I have to try and figure out. Yeah. And I think that's such a common challenge for people. You probably hear it come up in the groups all the time is people talking about the, the challenge of the habit piece. Um, I wanted to go back just a second. When we first started, you were talking about, um, I think you said seeking therapy and perhaps like behavior cue techniques or habit cue techniques. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? If there's anything that you've learned that, that has helped you in that regard, just because I'm not exactly sure um, what you mean by that. I think uh, so. Yeah, there, there was, there's some behavioral therapy was in there. Um, The, 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 the aspects that really stood out for me. Um, as being incredibly helpful game changers is the first thing is to to not um, to not beat myself up because I drank a lot on a particular day and to and to acknowledge and appreciate you know my wins and my successes. Uh, one of the interesting things that she did is she'd have me give myself a grade for the week. I'd be like, oh no, I've got that's definitely a D. And she's like, well, wait a minute, you said there were two days you didn't drink at all. And so she would point out for me, like, you can look at it a totally different way. And then you feel excited rather than rather than um, despondent. And so it makes you it makes you more willing to, to pay attention. Because one of the things is that if you wind up, if you wind up, if I when I wound up hating on myself, it, you, I just wanted to like, go drink some more, so that I would not feel that anxiety and, and, uh, and depression and all of those negative emotions that I was giving myself. And I didn't need to have those negative emotions. It it wasn't helpful or necessary. And that, that was one of the big things that stood out for me. Uh, But also trying, trying to think through, um, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the behavioral elements as far as, you know, okay, well, you know, you can try different techniques, like, you know, maybe, maybe you, maybe you don't go to your, to your favorite bar where you're going to know everybody and they're going to, and you're going to want to stay because you're going to want to have the conversations and it's more difficult to stick around and not drink. It's possible. I've done it. I've mixed in non-alcoholic drinks. I've hung out with my friends for hours and not had anything to drink. And, uh, you know, that's, that's another thing is that she helped me understand, um, that, uh, that other people in your life, don't care as much as you think they do about how much you're drinking. Like they really don't pay attention. Like, you know, if you, if oh, you say that you're not going to drink today because you didn't take your pill, right. Yeah. Or because you just don't want to, then that it might cause, it might cause a minor discussion, like three sentences worth of, Oh, really? Why is that? Uh, you know, I got, I've got to get up in the morning, trying to lose weight. There's all kinds of things you can do. You don't have to, you don't have to give people your entire medical history and describe the Sinclair method. Like you can just say, I'm just not drinking tonight and then attach whatever meaningful excuse um, to make it socially easier. And then they're not going to pay any attention to it after that. Like they're not going to come back in an hour and say, oh, you're still not drinking. Like that's not a thing. Right. So help, help helping me to understand that, you know, the world doesn't have to revolve around my drinking and it won't, right? Unless I let it. If you become a set obsessive about it, if, if, and I've heard this and I've read a lot of quit literature as well, you know, if you go into a party with the expectation that you're going to have a horrible time because you're not drinking, you will have a horrible time. But if you go in with the expectation that you're going to have a great time and you just happen to be not drinking, then it's, you, you'll have a good time eventually. You know, it may feel awkward at first. It did for me in certain situations. Uh, but now it's just not, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. And I've, I've, you know, she encouraged me to open up to my friends too, so that they can help me. Like if they know that I'm trying to cut down on drinking, they'll be less likely to, you know, to, to make any kind of a commotion about it. Um, you know, not that they were going to do it anyway. Right. But they, they can be supportive. You can reach out to them if you're like, Hey, you know, I don't know what's going on right now. I've, I've got some bad news and, you know, let me talk to you and kind of tell you this. And I've, I've been surprised by how many other people in, in my, in my personal life also have had the same thoughts. You know, I think I should be cutting down too, 
or you know yeah uh, i've been i've been thinking of doing doing something similar so tell me about you know tell me about what you're doing and i can tell them about the sinclair method and you know they it's it's the situation that you know not everybody is having a great time out there drinking like there's a lot of us out here that are are really seeing negative impacts on important things in our lives and and i think we have this i think we have i certainly had this sense that it was only me like and then and then and then you know the guy the guys that the guys that you see you know uh panhandling or you know it, it's me and those guys and nobody else like every, nobody i work with has a problem with alcohol and it's like well no that's not the reality we know that this is pervasive and so you know having this understanding that other people are going through the same thing a lot of people and so you don't have to feel like there's something especially wrong with you it's what alcohol is designed to do is to get you to drink more alcohol and so it's going to happen to people so um you know that was that was a big that was a big thing for me as well absolutely and as you were talking about you know just talking about using the verbiage cutting down on drinking have you found that to be less intimidating because i feel like if i'm in a social situation i'm like i'm just trying to cut back that's so much more easy to say i think than like i'm not drinking you know it's just like yeah. nah, you know it's hard to yeah. argue with i think i'm curious if you've had mm -hmm. that experience yeah i think so i think mm -hmm. so and i think the the other thing is um you know there's there's something there's something final about telling people that you're quitting drinking because then it's like oh okay now i'm they're never going to be comfortable around you you know in the future drinking because they have this misconception that it matters whether they drink in front of you or not and like all those kinds of things so yeah i do think that it's it's helpful to say cutting down or and and that's the reality of what i want also at the moment although you know one of the things i am interested to discover when i get further down my my road i know uh, one of the common things you hear um, for people who have reached extinction with tsm is that their intention was only to cut down and then they wind up just not drinking you know at all because they've lost interest in it entirely so you know i'm 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 prepared for that to happen I'm, i think i'd be all right with that but <laughs> i'll just see i'll just see how it is there's there's also people uh on the sinclair method who are who are perfectly comfortable you know having a couple of beers at a ball game or a glass of wine with dinner and you know so it gives you the options um, when you when you can reach that stage, and so I think it's perfectly appropriate to say that uh, that that you're cutting back. And yeah. uh, I forget forget who it was, but uh, the author of one of the books that I read um, had says, I, "I haven't quit drinking. I just I just I drink whenever I want to. I just haven't wanted to for the past five years." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, I, so there's not that pressure. And then she says, if at some point, you know, I just happened to want to take a drink and took a drink, it wouldn't be this giant failure and turn in all your chips. And no, it would just be, it would, wouldn't, you wouldn't have attached that importance to it if it ever happened. And so, you know, I think even the people who are, who have, who have kind of gotten into that realm, I think it makes sense um, to be thinking of it, you know, in those terms. And that's why you'll hear, you know, I've certainly heard stories of people who've reached extinction with TSM and they're still carrying naltrexone on their keychain. They don't take it because they aren't drinking, but that's always there for them, uh, you know, in case that they, you know, got into that situation and they find it very comfort comfortable and helpful. And I know that was one of the pieces of advice for me, just as an aside is, you know, hey, if you're out running around and this and that, like, well, I, I, my Daltrex and somebody told me about the little pill container that you can attach to your keychain. So if you get a call from somebody, one of your friends while you're at work, and they're like, hey, you know, something, something's going down, or like, you know, hey, I just need, need, I want to hang out or, you know, whatever, I've got the pill, I don't have to worry about and that's part of how compliance got better for me too, is those situations were now solved. Yeah. Is that the ad hoc stuff, okay, I can take my pill, my pill is always on my person, and I can take it whenever and wherever I need to. Yeah. So absolutely. That's a great advice. And I'm I'm actually one of those people who I kept the keychain pill holder on my keychains for my first year of not drinking uh, after I reached extinction. And I was like, I guess I can take it off now. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of, I guess, have you speak a little bit to us about what was your drinking like before the Sinclair method compared to where you're at now. I know you said you're about 30% down, but can you paint a picture of what 
you know, your day in the life was like before TSM versus now? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my, my drinking had built up to the point where it was, I, I was, I wasn't ever quite a daily drinker, but not too far off from it. Right. And so it, it would be, it would be, I'm drinking, I'm you know, guessing like, you know, 20 to 24 drinks on Thursday and then stumbling through work. And then Friday is another giant binge session. And then, you know, Saturday, Saturday is, well, it's the weekend. So let's get up in the morning and let's start drinking at, you know, 11 o'clock or noon or whatever, you know, and then drink throughout the day. And then, you know, Sunday, maybe taper off a little bit, maybe even get to the point where it's like, okay, I've been drinking the entire weekend. Um, so that was, that was very common for me. Um, and then it started to encroach into other days of the week. Like all of a sudden now uh, I'm, I'm drinking heavily on Monday, you know, to the point where I'm, I'm getting up hungover. I'm, I'm not able to, I'm not able to exercise. I'm not able to do the things I want to do. It's really getting in the way. And uh, so the major, the major issue was that I, I wasn't, wasn't even really cognizant of what I was doing. Like, I didn't really think it through even. It was just, you know, okay, well, I guess this is, this is life. This is how I do this. And, you know, never really, it was, it was, it was pre-contemplative is that I hadn't yet even like really identified like the, it wasn't, I need to change my drinking habits. It was, oh, I really shouldn't have had that much yesterday. Right. So I didn't look at it as a pattern and as a problem in my life that needed to be solved. It was like, oh man, I overdid it. I, I should really take it easy next time. But it, there was no, there was no approach to like, hey, maybe I, maybe I better seek help or do this sort of thing or do that sort of thing, um, you know. And uh, you know, I think what what started to get me thinking about it is that um, I had some numbness in my foot, uh, neuropathy, and so I, that's when the doctor told me you really got to cut out drinking. And this is one of the, one of those common stories, like, you know, the, the, a doctor will like mine will say, you just need to stop drinking. It's like, oh, okay, gee, thanks for telling me. Now, how am I supposed to do that? Well, uh, well there is this pill you can take, I guess. It's like the support system isn't always there um, to get you where you need to go. Like, you know, I, I wish that my doctor, when that, when that first came around, I wish my doctor had suggested you should really see a therapist and discuss who's 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 an expert in substance abuse and treatment somebody who knows the recovery process and can really guide you through the things that you need to do uh is really is really something that i would hope is that you know they they wouldn't the doctor themselves wouldn't necessarily have to know about the sinclair method um and there's and, and i guess i'll mention also that my my therapist was not a sinclair method type person either um she sounded yeah. like such a great therapist though from the she was. Like, that's yep. awesome absolutely very helpful and gave me a lot of techniques um her impression of the Sinclair method when I mentioned it um is that she she had heard from from people in rehab settings and so forth that they were doing TSM and they just expected oh well all I have to do is to take the pill and then uh, I'm just not going to drink anymore and that'll be cool and so she, her, her impression was, but no, you got to work on these other things. And so I, I kind of go back and forth on that um, because I, I know I've heard both opinions. Like there's some people that I've heard and professionals who are, who are, you know, guiding people in the TSM process that I've heard from, you know, on the, uh, on the body daily groups um, talking about how critically important it is to, do, to log all your drinks, for instance. Um, and then I hear other people who say, but that doesn't really matter. And so it, I'm still kind of in a state of confusion about it, but I know what works for me. And what works for me is going through these different techniques um, for, for, for behavioral. Um, and what works for me is keeping track and looking at that log and getting that, getting that, little, that little dopamine hit of seeing my average drink bar go down. Like I'll, I'll look at, I'll look at you know, where I was a month ago and say, oh, but if I, if I, if I only drink four today, but 30 days ago, I drank 12, then I've just scored eight points. <laughs> yes. I love it. You make it a game. <laughs> <laughs> let me get it. Let me get a personal best this week, you know? I love uh, it. And, uh, and so then there's a lot of ways of looking at, um, of looking at that data. Like, 
you know, how many alcohol free days did you have in the past month? And how many days did you have that were like big binge days, which, you know, for me, for me, that, that can be, that can be as high as like 20 standard drinks. It's a lot, you know, and you know, see, seeing the number of those big bars go down, that's probably my biggest metric is, you know, I want I want those to go to zero, right? Like the other stuff, like, oh, alcohol, how many alcohol free days, you know, do I drink two or do I drink four? Like, that's not the important thing for me in the harm reduction phase. The important thing for me is to get rid of those giant bars <laughs> um, that, that represent, you know, everything that I don't like uh, about the person I am is, you know, I want to be the person who gets up in the morning and does all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I was, I was alcohol free last week for uh, six days. And, uh, and it was, it was kind of comfortable. Like I had to use some of the behavioral techniques and reinforcements and, you know, did some meditation as helpful as well. Um, and, but it wasn't, it wasn't much, right. It wasn't like I was spending all day trying not to drink. It was, oh, I kind of got a craving. I got an impulse. Uh, and all I got to do is distract myself for five or 10 minutes. And then it's, we're just back to having a normal day. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I definitely credit TSM and the medication for making, making that possible um, so that things don't build up. And knowing that I haven't made this giant commitment, like, oh, I've told all my friends I'm going to be alcohol free for 30 days. Like that terrifies me. The whole concept of like, oh, I'm doing dry, dry July or something like that. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. It would feel like I failed if I, I could, I could be alcohol free for the first three weeks. And then if I committed to 30 days, it's like, well, now I drank. So I failed as opposed to like, I scored 29 out of 30, <laughs> you know? Right. So there's kind of that all or nothing thinking is well, that's another thing that, um, that my therapist um, had brought up and we discussed is the concept of all or nothing thinking where it's like, oh, I intended not to drink, but then I did drink, but I, it was only two. Like, well, that's a win. Like, you know, that's not a failure just because you didn't go according to plan. And that's one of the things that, that, I've, that I've spent a lot of time thinking about because you will, hear, you will hear different people talk about different approaches. So there's people who say, well, you should lay out your whole plan for the week and you're going to do, you know, five alcohol-free days and two extinction events or, you know, and, and they've got this whole big like plan all marked out for them. And then there's other people that are just like, you know, just go with the flow and decide what you want to do day by day. And I think there's nothing right or wrong about either approach. I think you experiment with it. And okay, well, the, the, for me, the whole weekly plan of I'm going to do this this day and that a different day, there was too much pressure is that I felt I found I was obsessing over how I was going to do it. And I'm, you know, instead of living in the moment and in the now, I'm worried about what's going to happen Friday. It's like, it's Tuesday. Don't worry about what Friday is going to do. We're let Friday worry about Friday. Um, and so for me, it's better for me to just decide first thing when I wake up is that is when you are at your most, you know, your highest cognitive level, right? Is, you know, you're, you, you might be a little hungry, but you're, you're not tired, hopefully. <laughs> um, and you're, and you're, and you're prepared to make a decision and you're prepared to focus as opposed to trying to, trying to make that decision. What I would always find and still do is that I've got, I've got, I've got all the commitment in the world at 9am. And then when the hard day of work is done and I'm on, on my way home, it's like, oh, you know, this morning I was thinking that I wasn't going to go have a drink today, but uh, I kind of feel like having a drink now. <laughs> so exactly being able to being able to reinforce for yourself, you know, what you're going to do um, and then uh, and then have that, you know, I, I, I like to do a little, uh, you know, a little a little a little daily mantra that I can repeat to myself. You know, whatever, whenever I'm thinking of deviating from my plan, um, and I and I prefer to stay on the plan, like just repeat, you know, over and over. Like one one of the ones recently that I had was uh, determination is my superpower. Oh, I love so it. Like, you know, you say that. So in the morning when I'm fresh, I say that over and over out loud, like you know, 20, 30 times, and then that will pop into my head whenever I my thoughts wander later. 
And that way, at least it forces me to make a conscious decision as opposed to just kind of drifting over and having a drink without really thinking about it. Um, it also helps reinforce for me the compliance part of TSM is that, you know, by, by taking that moment and taking that step, then you won't just reach for a drink. And this was especially important to me in the earlier days, you know, maybe a couple of months in now, not so much now, now it's just kind of ingrained habit, but you know, it wasn't, I was building a new habit to be compliant. And so having that pause where I'm like, okay, what do we do next? Okay. First thing we do when we're thinking about changing our plan is go to the mantra. What's the next thing? If we do decide to change the plan, then we go take our pill and we set our timer on our wristwatch so that it's counting down from the 60 minutes. So you don't have to remember. I, I found that was really useful for me with my smartwatch is so I don't have to remember what was it 715 or was it this or was it that? And then seeing it actually physically ticking down kind of lets you know, okay, yeah, it will eventually, it will be eventually be time. And, uh, and then like others, I've started to experience okay, my hour is up and now whatever, whatever trigger I had that caused me to decide to drink isn't there anymore. Like that's been solved now, whatever that issue was. Uh, and so now it's like, well, do I still want to, do I still want to drink? Like, you know, so it, it, that's, that's an amazing feeling too is, you know, and it, and it shows you having to wait that hour shows you that it's not that bad. You can wait an hour. Anybody can wait an hour. I think most, most people would, would agree, you know, that you can delay that much even if you've got a strong craving, you know, it's, you know, it'll be over and you know, yeah, it's, you, you don't really want to wait, but you know, you can, and it, and you know, it's waiting there for you at the end of that hour. And so you're not obsessive about, you know, not drinking. Like if you were trying to, if you had committed to like, well, no, I can't drink ever. Then, then that, that's a long time to wait. Would just keep feeding back. <laughs> you just get stuck in that, uh, you know, in that mind loop. Right where you, it, you that's the only thing you're thinking of and there's no way that it's not sustainable like if, if you if you get into that obsessive state then it, sooner or later your willpower will break down you know it, maybe not that day right and that's why relapse is is so common i assume is you know what for people who are trying without the silk clair method and don't have the benefit of pharmacological extinction then they're just going to always get in that loop. And so that's much more common, um, you know, for people who are depending on willpower and group supports to eventually slip up. And, uh, and that doesn't make them a bad person. But what I've heard from people who have completed their TSM journey is that they don't have that experience, right? Is that, you know, they don't get caught up in the loops. It's like, oh, okay, I thought about alcohol, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And I think you hit on some really important points about TSM being kind of customizable to you, like what works for you and what may not work for someone else. And that's the beauty of this method. Like everyone's taken the pill an hour or two before, but whatever else you do to help yourself along, it's like really what works for you. Cause I know for some people logging your drinks, logging their drinks can give them serious anxiety. They're not ready to face the number yet. And okay, then don't force them to log their drinks if they're not going to do it. But how else can they be mindful and aware and, um, you know, taking care of themselves and doing other things to support them on their journey? So I think you brought up such an important point that there is no right or wrong, you know, how you do this method. Uh, but yeah, what works for the individual. And it sounds like you have a pretty solid recipe for success for yourself laid out. Yeah, I feel I, I do feel positive. I mean, I, I think I think like a lot of people um, who are who are kind of at this stage of, you know, okay, I'm about four months in, I'm, I'm definitely seeing serious progress. There's no question that I'm going to continue with the method. Right. But we're all like, well, when when do I get to the finish line? Like, you know, it's like, and then, then you know, sometimes sometimes my experience is that when you hear about other people's journeys, then it can, it can, it can, it can give me maybe not anxiety exactly, but like, it, it's like, oh, okay, well, that person finished in two months, what's wrong with me? And then I look at the person who's like, well, it took me three years, but it finally, finally took, 
And I'm like, oh man, I got to wait three years. <laughs> so I think, you know, you, you can't compare yourself to other people um, and say, you know, a lot of people I've, I've seen in groups, there are a number of people who kind of kind of lose faith, lose, lose that excitement and enthusiasm because they're like, nothing's happening. It's, it's you know, I, I, I'm doing it and like, I, I, I feel like I've made no progress. Um, and so I think, you know, it's important to just kind of, you know, commit and experiment with some of the, some of some different techniques. Right. And then, then at least you're doing something proactive. So if all you're doing is being compliant and then not really making any, not choosing to do anything else, then it feels stagnant. But if you were trying different techniques like a mantra or meditation or exercise or, you know, this or that arts and crafts, you know, if you, if you're trying something different every week, even if you're still drinking the same amount, you feel like you're making attempts. You feel like you're, you're trying stuff and eventually you'll find something that works as opposed to just waiting is kind of the advice that I would give. That's awesome advice. It, it truly is. And it's come up so much on calls this week where people who are at four months or six months and they're feeling like, shoot, I'm like at a plateau and like, where's everyone else? How, like everyone else is doing it faster than me. But I, I think that that's not true in most cases. Most <laughs> people take at least like nine months, a year or more, yeah. like more yeah. commonly, that's what I see. So I think it's such a common uh, frustration people have on the method, I guess. But it's just, I think, because once we get on the method, we wanted the problem fixed yesterday. So we're like impatient to get it done, which for me, that just shows that the person's motivated to, to change the behavior. And like, that's a great sign, but it does take time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know there's, there's also, there, there can also be that, that kind of honeymoon period where somebody started the Sinclair method. It's been like two or three weeks and they're like, wow, you know, all my cravings are gone. And it's like, okay, that, I'm glad you're excited. And I'm glad you didn't drink very much. And I don't know, I don't know exactly what, I don't know what to tell people like that. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to discourage them. But at the same time, it's like, you, I, I want you to be prepared, you know, that, you know, when you get to your five and six week mark, you may be back um, yeah. to, uh, to where you were in the, in the, in the, in the first place, Yeah. you know, for a while. Right. Yeah. Did you have a honeymoon period? Uh, I did. I did. I think you, you wind up, you wind up feeling like you're, uh, like you're focused. I'm sorry. My light went out here. Oh, so go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Turn it back on. Do I you want to turn I, I'll see if I can. Let me, oh, let me take a look. yeah, no problem. Okay. But yeah, no, I think, I think definitely, you know, the, 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 the honeymoon period was real for me. Um, the, I think you go in feeling really excited. Like my situation was I had read the Sinclair method and I, and I intellectually, I knew that these changes take time, but I was so excited about the prospect that something was going to be different and it wasn't going to be like other times where I'd been like, Oh, I should really not drink it all this week. And then I wound up drinking, like this was going to make it different. And so I think you get that excitement. And I, even though I didn't have, you know, gr a group of people to, um, to relate their experiences or even read about them, you know, just reading, just reading the, the description of the studies, um, that Sinclair did was enough for me to be like, oh, I'm super excited. This is going to be great. And so you're, 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 you've got a natural uh, endorphin high from your excitement about the process and about making change in your life. And then that's not sustainable. And then you go back. Um, but it, it's, it's great while it lasts. <laughs> But it's, it's reassuring that it's like a common phase for people because so many people get discouraged and think, is this not going to work for me? Because we all have that fear. But it's honestly like, I think it's more part of the process than not. I see it over and over and over again. So um, did you want to talk also about just some challenges you've had in general on the method? Uh, just to highlight some of those, if there are some. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I think overall... I haven't had, uh, I haven't had, um, you know, too many challenges since I really started to look at it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a natural, I'm a natural note taker. So logging for me was second nature because I had done it with food apps forever, logging calories. So I've already had that discipline. So that 
that part of it. And I know that's not the most essential part. So you know, when it comes to compliance, uh, the real challenge was surprise surprise events. Is you know my 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 girlfriend drops by and she's got a bottle with her and it's like oh I didn't even know you were coming and also I wasn't planning on drinking today and so it's like oh well you know do you want to, do you want to have a glass of wine with me I find that that's that that's when I have the most pressure to be non-compliant is when it's like oh it's right here in the moment and telling somebody else uh yeah we could we could have a glass together in an hour <laughs> I think that's I think that's a difficult one um since since then you know I've told her about I uh, told her about my medication and how how all of that works and now she's supportive and understanding but at the time we hadn't known each other that long and so I wasn't going to go into a big description of my alcohol uh, abuse which is what people look at it as right it's like <laughs> oh you're uh you're an alcoholic then like well no not really it's, it's called it's it, it's it's called alcohol use disorder and let me give you a whole dissertation about it <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you my name's eric <laughs> <laughs> so no so now she's aware of it and i'll be like and i and, and it's very comfortable now where i'm just like oh uh yeah um i'm gonna have a glass of water uh, and then i'll and i'll join you or you know or she won't even ask like you know, because because she's aware of it um so uh so i think so i think that's probably the 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 biggest thing when it comes to compliance and then uh and then one challenge that that i that i just kind of came across recently because i wondered about this because we know we we, we know that the, it's an hour until you have your peak but i was like well when does it really wear off and uh you know because it's like well wait i i had i had a glass of champagne with breakfast like you know mimosas are wonderful and that that was great to have with my eggs benedict and now i'm not drinking all day and then in the evening it's like oh you know a beer would go great with this burger and it's like well what happened because that pill i took 12 hours ago what's really still going on with that and uh and so i've done some reading recently um about redosing and about you know about uh you know the half-life for getting out of the system i won't Go into those details because I'd probably butcher the details, and and I'm not a professional, but uh, but that was an interesting thing that I came across recently is that concept and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I did I was fortunate enough not to have side effects. Uh, I, I I don't have I don't associate any negative side effects with taking the pill. It, it's it's nothing to me. I'm very fortunate because I know other people do struggle with that. Um, that would make it difficult for me, you know, if I were if I were if I were having to deal with a side effect, then I think that would make it harder to be compliant because it's like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make myself feel bad. Um, so I think that would make it more difficult. I know people have overcome those challenges and there's lots of different things people can do. Um, I was just fortunate not to have that, that particular challenge. Um, and getting prescriptions for me has been easy. My doctor just re-ups the prescription. I've never actually talked to my primary care physician about the Sinclair method. I just have her keep giving me the scrippies. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and like, okay, I don't need to educate you on this. Like yeah. if I, if I go in um, at some point, I'll be going in for, you know, for a follow-up, I'll probably, I'll probably mention it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I know I can find another doctor if she's like, well, I'm going to take that away from you if you're not doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's how doctors work, but <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't think I have to, I don't think I have to be concerned about it. But I, but I also, it's also not my job to convince her that this is a good method and this is how it works and, you know, and, and, and kind of do that. If she wants some information, then I would get, I'd leave it. I'd probably, probably have some information and resources like C3 Foundation printed out. And I'd just be like, hey, if you're interested in what I'm actually doing and if other patients might be able to benefit from it, here's where you could go and then leave it at that. Because mm -hmm. I, would I would like for, for more people to be educated about this method and, and not have to stumble on it the way I did. It would be nice if people could get funneled into it um, in, and, and know, what, know what's going on from the start mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and find you know, the, the support groups as well yeah. to, uh, to help guide you through the process beyond just, oh, okay, here's, here's some stuff you can read. Because I think different people respond differently. And I'm a big, you know, book learning kind of person. 
And I was shocked at how much of a difference it made just hearing people share their own stories. It wasn't even, it's not even to get information. It's just to feel like you're not on your own. Totally. And, uh, and it's absolutely wonderful to be able to do that. And, uh, and, and, you know, listen to, uh, you know, listen to, to various podcast podcasts like the naked mind and your, your program here on YouTube and, you know, have, having all of that, like, Oh, okay. You know, there's a bunch of other people and here's some people who try, who started years before you and they, they, they're, they're really happy with their outcomes and they're, they're so excited about the process that they're sticking around to help people like they're, they're done like they don't need to do this for them anymore but they're doing it because they want to encourage others and that they want to be able to let people know hey i was where you were and this is where you can be just kind of keep, keep going and don't get down on yourself so much that you wind up quitting the whole thing and saying it's not worth it because that's the only way you wind up losing is if you stop trying yeah. right and having people <laughs> help keep telling you that uh, is enormous. And so it's great for the people who have completed that journey uh, to be able to talk to people like me and kind of get us through the, get us through the process and kind of, you know, just share, oh yeah, I remember that happening to me too. Yeah. I'm curious, have you had the challenge of what people call, you know, drinking through the naltrexone or drinking beyond it? Um, I don't know if I've, I've really heard that phrase. Uh, I assume it's it's this it's, it's this binge concept where you get to some point where you're where you're. I mean, well, so my my situation is that on those big bar evenings, you know, when I'm having twenty drinks, I'm not drinking twenty drinks blindfully, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, really? I'm drinking seven of them mindfully or eight. And then I'm, and then, and then, so, you know, maybe that could be described as drinking through it. Like, yeah. okay, now I've reached the point, you know, where I am just habitually like the more, 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 more. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's no, there's no breaks at that point. And so, you know, I know, I know my, I know my limit where that starts happening is at about six or seven drinks. And so I try to, I try to look very carefully when I'm about to cross that threshold and I'm getting more and more successful at pulling back and saying, hey, you're at that threshold where you're about to not really be cognizant of your process and what you want out of things. And you're just going to be mindless. Um, so maybe maybe now is the time that you better stop. I'm not super successful at it yet. <laughs> I'm having some successes and that's good enough for now. But, you know, that's definitely that's definitely a situation where, um, you know, the. Uh, the, it, the it, it's, it's a very clear bright line definition for me of like okay if you if you go over this in this amount of time and so it's really about you know i'm back to my statistics again um you know the the app that i use is called alkadroid hmm. and uh it's for 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 android phones clearly uh and it, it will tell you um you know what your top blood alcohol percentage is or, or the current one, it'll calculate it based on your body weight and it's pretty accurate. But the, the important thing there is that that's another statistic is, okay, I know that if I know that if I get into this 0.1 range, then that's when I'm going to be in trouble. So it's not so much the number of drinks, but it's also how fast, right? So it, it's more important for me to look at that number and say, okay, there's your threshold. You're about to cross it. You're about to make decisions that you may not be real happy with tomorrow. And, uh, and try and pull out. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, that's, that's something that, you know, that is something that I'm working on. Well, I love your mindset about it because I think it's a common challenge. A lot of people face and they can be kind of like a panic, like, Oh no, is this not working? Like it didn't stop me from drinking 20 yeah. drinks last night or however many, but it, like right. you said, you're having some wins, some successes. It's not like you're always doing that. It's just this like chiseling away at the problem. And with each drinking session and extinction session, you're getting closer and closer to where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. So how has your life changed like in general since getting on the Sinclair method like what improvements have you seen in your day-to-day -day life um I'm getting uh I'm getting I'm getting a lot more personal bests on my Peloton bike 
<laughs> yes. It's, it's funny. It's funny how I can track it, and I can and I and I can I can look at the vars on my on my on my on my Alcadroid, and then line them up with my exercise days, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, you don't really want to get up and bike for 45 minutes if you had 20 drinks last night. <laughs> yeah. I love that you're all about the data. This is awesome. <laughs> I can't help myself, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, lining it up. So I'm gonna correlate this and average yeah. that. And... <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, for me, for me, that's that's you know that's that's one of the super super good things because you know when I when I when I had my when I I mentioned recently I went you know six days alcohol free. Well, I I put in like real solid workouts every one of those days, and I'm like, this is great. And the other thing that I love about the exercise being is that is that it's a positive feedback too, because I'm getting nice endorphins from like really pushing my limits and really like getting all of that all that energy and reduce releasing stress. Like that's a huge thing for me um, to be able to get you know more more physically active. You know, I used to I used to I used to I used to row crew at the university when a long time ago, um, and I'm getting some of that feeling back of like really pushing myself to a limit. And, you know, that's, uh, that's something that's huge, that's coming back into my life, you know, in a big way, because it, it's been, uh, it's been about coincident is, uh, it was about February that I got my bike delivered. Uh, and it was about April that I started doing the Sinclair method. So they kind of went hand in hand. So there was an association there and, uh, and they definitely feed positively uh, on each other. So that, that's definitely huge. Um, my, uh, my, I know my, my work product has been better and I just, I just barely changed jobs four weeks ago. And one of the things is that I think if I hadn't been doing the Sinclair method, I would have been really terrified about changing jobs because, uh, you know, the, the level of drinking that I was at, it was okay. I'm getting away with this because, you know, the, the group, the group team that I manage, you know, is doing their jobs. And so I was able to autopilot that job. Well, if you're learning an entirely new company and new group of people, you can't be on autopilot. It's like, you've got to be present and you've got to be at the top of your game and not just kind of going through the motions and phoning it in and answering some emails, um, you know, which you can do if you, well, which I was able to do is you know kind of work around you know the the impact of my of my addiction and uh and you know i i would i would have been much more terrified and i definitely wouldn't have been feeling um confident and now i'm excited like every day I'm, we're tackling a new challenge and i'm you know i'm learning something new and i'm making things happen and I, i'm just genuinely excited and not spending my whole day spending the first half of my day regretting that I drank so much and then the second half of the day trying to figure out how soon I can have a drink especially working from home it's like you know I've, I've, I never I never really I never let myself get into that situation of drinking during my work day even though I've been remote I've been working remote since forever right <laughs> since everything went down in March um but uh and 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 so that you know that can be a could be a big thing, and and that's one of the reasons why I looked very carefully at that and not let that happen. Even even when I was not in the Sinclair method and everything, it's like well, we're we're not going to start drinking in the morning. We're not going to start drinking in the afternoon, um, because that we we know where that road can lead, and we don't want to take that path. Um, but now I'm coming off of even the path that I was on at that time um, to a much better road. It's a lot, a lot less bumpy. That is awesome. Well, I guess we can just start wrapping up here, but I, I want to wrap up, I guess, just by asking you what tips or advice you have for others who are on TSM based on what you've learned through your experience the past several months and even your experience with TSM before that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to, to kind of encapsulate, you know, all of the things that we've talked about that were successful for me. I think looking at the data is important and it is scary. Like when I first started logging and I, and I looked at that number and I said, heck, 
I drank 107 drinks this week. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I didn't want to see that number, but looking at that number is part of accepting where you are at that point in time. So I, I would I would highly recommend for anybody that you know might might be a little afraid of looking at the numbers, like just just write it down. Don't worry about what the number is. Don't try and change the number. Just make make the number happen, and then forget about it. And then just keep writing them down and like, you don't have to do anything with it, but you know, just, I, I would say that having that history, you know, will help you see smaller progress because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, without the data, I wouldn't have been able to say, oh, I think I've cut my drinking down by 30%. I'd probably, because of the negative outlook that's natural, I'd probably say nothing is happening. It's not working. If I didn't wow. have the data to convince me, right. Um, beyond that, you know, definitely look at, you know, various behavioral techniques. Um, there's a variety of things you can do. If you have the luxury of working with a therapist, I do recommend that. Um, if you don't, then there's a lot of books and resources out there as well. Um, so I would, I would, I would say getting into some of the behavioral cues uh, and figuring out, you know, wh wh why is it that you you're thinking about taking a pill and drinking right now? Why, why is that happening? Find out that association and see if you can make a substitution. That would be one for sure for me um, that I would recommend. And obviously the, the, the compliance is, is critical. You know, figure out, how, figure out how to do that. And if, when you're just starting out, just assume that you're gonna drink every day. Don't even worry about having alcohol-free days. It'll be much easier to get yourself started and get the ball rolling. Assuming that you were a daily drinker. If you're not, then, uh, then maybe, you know, don't add, <laughs> don't take away your alcohol-free days, but um, you know, that way, that way you're not pushing right up to your limits of, of being able to handle things. I guess what I'm saying is take the pill earlier than, than maybe you think you have to. Don't wait till the last possible second when you're first starting out. Um, later that kind of flips around and you want to try and push yourself out. Um, but that would be something that I would say because that'll give you that compliance um, uh, discipline is that that's a way to do that so that you're not waiting until the last second. So those, those things, I think. Uh, and I would also say that, uh, you know, the, the, the groups are very good uh, on Facebook, um, TSM Breakthrough, and there's TSM Beginnings for the people who are just starting out. So there's a separate group that's just for beginners. That's where I started. Uh, and, and you specifically are able to ask all the questions and hear all the questions for beginners. Um, so it's very much oriented towards that initial process and getting that this kind of advice about oh here's something you want to watch out for here's something you want to think about uh, getting that in that environment um, and uh, I'm also on Club Soda and that's a kind of a UK based group and they're they're very accepting of people who are you know trying to cut down as opposed to quit forever they're not they're not a group that's gonna neither of those are groups that are trying to pressure anybody one of them is TSM oriented, the other one isn't. Um, but uh, Club Soda has lots of great recommendations for non-alcoholic drinks. And that's something that I've found really valuable too, is experiment with the non-alcoholic drinks. I've got, you know, uh, you know non-alcoholic beer, I'm on a subscription. So it just shows up to my house, it's gonna be there. And I find that even on, sometimes on days that I've taken my pill and I've decided to drink, I'll go to the fridge, I'll see the non-alcoholic beer and I'll say, you know what, I think I like that. I think I think that seems more appealing to me, which is another sign that, that this process really is working. And so I would say have some have some of those non, try some of those non alcoholic alternatives because um, they're out there and they're a lot of fun. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much, Eric. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you have on your mind that you wanted to share or speak about? No, I think we I think we we covered a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that I've related in, in the, in the groups yeah. and, uh, and most, most of, most of my thoughts about, about process. And, you know, I, I, I thank you and all of the people out there that are, that are supporting people like me going through this process. I really appreciate it. Heck yes. Maybe we'll have you back in like a year once you've reached extinction or something. Right, Part two. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a great rest of your day. I'll talk to you later, Eric. Yep, I'll talk to you later. Bye.